All right. Hello, Mr. Lewis. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for being on with us. Uh, I have some questions for you that I think our readers would love to know. So you were a uh, president of the school board of Carol ISD. And um, so when were you president, like from in during what years and what was that like, the election process and um, in what ways do you think it's changed? Okay, so I ran for school board right after I moved to South Lake in 1987. So I think I ran in 1988 um, and I didn't win. And I was appointed by some council people then who I met along that process to uh, be on the Planning and Zoning Commission. But then I re-ran for school board on in 1990 and was elected. I ran again in 93 and was elected. I ran again in 96 and was elected. And uh, from 96 to 99, they're all three-year terms, I served as board president of the Carroll ISD. So how has that changed? I mean, the most significant thing was in those five times that I ran, including each one of those, there were actual times you went into the Fort Worth Star program or that morning news Tory awards and were interviewed and they either made recommendations or things like now. And um, not one person ever asked me my political affiliation, who I voted for for president or whether I was affiliated with any particular group. It was purely wow. non-political. It was purely nonpartisan. And it was purely for people that were running for the reasons to uh, make public education the best it can be for all students. So during that time, we had unwritten rules that, that it, it's in the TASB guidelines even today. It's recommended that you don't run slates, that you don't combine your slate with city council slates because there are two political subdivisions. I mean, school boards run on a whole different methodology of taxing and funding. Uh, cities don't have Robin Hood or recapture. Schools do. So it's a totally different way to raise money and to effectuate best practices. So, um, so you know, it's changed now because we have not only do we have slates, my God, we have political parties. I mean, we, we at no time during that whole period did the Tarrant County Democrat or Republican Party make any recommendations or get involved in a local school board race. I mean, they had counties to deal with. They didn't mess around with this. And now we have Patriot Mobile. We have Tim O'Hare. We have the whole county mechanism of Republicans that are trying to blow up and take over school boards. And that's just not a good thing for children or our future. So, okay, you had two kids that were in Carroll ISD. And you know, you said they did very well back then uh, with how things were being run. And uh, it sounds like if you know one of them was salutatorian. Um, I guess my question is, uh, how much do you think Carol ISD has changed um, since the time that you've lived there? And and you know what are what are the reasons for that? Do you think like of course there's been a lot covered in the news about racism and um, you know uh gay rights and transgender and all of that um so how do you do you think that you know, it's gotten better it's gotten worse um do you think that should even be a part of it like have you always seen racism in the district the way things changed and the way things stay the same kind of can be the same question in this circumstance i mean when i was on the board in the first couple of years we had a uh we were sued by the aclu on a school prayer issue uh because we had student-led prayer at basically every event, and that was, at that point in time, clearly unconstitutional, according to our legal representatives. And we had the decision to make as to whether we were going to keep fighting that or whether we were going to follow the law. And once we followed the law, our constituents, even though they were, they were adamant that we needed to have more school prayer in school, and that was a big problem at that point in time, particularly the evangelicals, uh, once we explained everything to them and talked about it, everybody was was okay with that explanation. It was like our citizens actually believed in following the law once they really had it explained to them and they had a chance to talk about it. We had two book challenges during that nine years. 
One was Maya Angelou, the Cage Birds sings, and the other was a story about a, a teenage boy at 16 who lied to get into the military and was obviously thrust into circumstances that were very adult in a lot of different ways, and there was some profanity. So we had both of those books come up within months of each other, and uh, we were able to put the policy in place that basically was the policy up until the recent time when Matt Krause decided to list his books that needed to be removed. And uh, before that, we had board members who got involved in a in what type of book a school teacher had at, at uh, one of our elementary schools. And they made a decision based on that and then, in fact, violated the policy that we put together at that point in time, which was not to have the school board make decisions on that, but to leave it to the experts and follow the 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 guidelines of librarians and teachers on how they um, found age appropriate materials. So it, the, the decision back then would have just gone to the school to the, to it would have stopped at the, at the level of the superintendent and never gotten to the board to make a decision on what book ought to be in a library. And that should still be the case. Yeah, it sounds all very uh, logical, reasonable, you know, not um, really like I mean, what's been going on. We had issues. We had issues with racism back then. We had, you know, people, students, teachers say the N word. We had issues that we dealt with with that. We had uh, there was an issue uh, in a, a Grapevine Carroll football game where there was an acronym used that uh, was was very racist and very derogatory, which I was board president at the time. And it was a full blown apology to the great Mount Colleyville ISD and students were reprimanded and and coaches that were involved in it were reprimanded uh, and actions taken. But, you know, as as things have 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 evolved through that time to now. I mean, I actually see things getting worse now because it seems like that that there's a certain segment of our population now who believe that that if 70 percent or 65 percent of the people think it's OK to be racist, that you can be racist and not have to follow the law or the Constitution or protect all students' rights. What do you think, if you had to say, is behind all of this, like uh, circus sideshow sensationalism? Like, what is the goal, you think? Is it a voucher system? And so it's just like all being blown out of proportion in order to get to that end game? My opinion is that the, the whole anti-racism, anti-diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-Black history uh, is just due to systemic racism. I can go back to how we handled some of the racism issues and the acronym issue that I discussed. I mean, we did what we did. That was the recommended practice by, by administrators and even board members. It was what we thought we could do. But in reality, I think we pushed the, you know, pushed it down the road, kicked the can down the road, didn't really ever fully address you know, the original sin of America, which is racism and how it has in, been ingrained in, in how white board members handle racism is, in, instances in a place like Carroll that didn't have a very large black population at that time. In fact, then I think it was less than 25 total students. So do you think it has to do with greed? Um you know, property well, taxes, um, like you said, the, uh, no, the capture. It has, to do, it has to do with greed, but not property tax greed. It has to do with greed on privatizing public education. So hedge fund operators in the top 1% of the 1% can, can acquire access to state and federal funds uh, for schools, and they want the money transferred to private charters or homeschoolers. I mean, we had a situation, how did it happen in Carroll? I don't know, but the last four or five mayors of Southlake have all had students that, that left the CISD and either went to private schools or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure of all the reasons, but I think I think that is part of the rationale. If you look at, if you look at, 
I mean, the Republican Party has basically said from Steve Bannon to Chris Rufo all the way down that they're going to use school boards as the entryway, the gateway to take over the country and uh, start with school boards, city councils. And believe me, back when I ran the first time, I spent less than a thousand dollars to get all my yard signs and to get all my mailers and to do all my postage. I mean, by the time I, I ended in 2000, it probably cost me $3,000, but, but I think Patriot Mobile spent $400,000 just in CCISD, Carroll, Keller, and Mansfield in the last election. And that's just obscene. Yeah, it they tells you that, that yeah, if you're going to <laughs> yeah, if you're going to buy a school board race, for political purposes, there is no way that you can say that that's best for all kids. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Mr. Luce. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.